Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My name is Lee Dirks. I'm the director for education and scholarly communications in the Microsoft Research Connections team. And uh, today I'm uh, very pleased to, uh, to have um, Hazel Asuncion from uh, University of Washington Bothell to uh, join us to give us a talk on automated um, traceability techniques. Um, um, Hazel is an assistant professor um, at the Computing and Software Systems Department at the University of Washington Bothell. She received her PhD in Information and Computer Science at the University of California, Irvine, where her research emphasis was software traceability. Um, further, she has worked in industry in a variety of roles as a software engineer at Unisys Corporation and as a traceability engineer at Wonderware Corporation, where she designed a successful in-house traceability system. So what I'd like to do now is uh, hand the podium over to Hazel to talk to us about um, automated traceability techniques in software engineering and e-science. Hazel, please. Thank you. Well, thank you all, and especially to Lee for having me come and talk about my research. Um, as Lee mentioned, I will be talking about automated traceability techniques for software engineering and e-science. I'll talk about the parallels uh, that take place in both fields and how the cross-fertilization of ideas can benefit both areas. All right, so more specifically, I will be talking about the following topics. I'll first introduce you to the idea of traceability and why it's important. Then I'll discuss traceability challenges, um, and this is in context of my industry project at Wonderware. I'll then move on and talk about insights that I've gleaned from the area of e-science to address some of these traceability challenges. Um, that endeavor resulted in a uh, practical approach to software traceability called ACTS. And then I'll move on and discuss how ACTS is enhanced with the use of machine learning technique called topic modeling. And then I'll wrap up the talk by discussing how AX-like techniques can be applied to e-science in supporting data provenance. All right, so let's talk about um, traceability. Envision a small software development team where you have one person in charge of each phase of the software lifecycle. So one person is in charge of creating the requirements documents, use cases. Another person is in charge of creating your structural design or state charts. Uh, the developer is in charge of coding and make, uh, updating the wiki pages. And finally, the QA engineer is in charge of creating the test cases and maintaining the bug database. So let's say that the person in charge of the requirements um, is interested in finding the related documentation for a particular requirement. Well, it's easy to see that that person can simply talk to the rest of the team and ask them for the related documentation. Now let's think of a scenario where you have a larger development organization and you have multiple people working on each phase of the software lifecycle. Now you have teams of people working on each phase. And these teams have their own uh, set of tools, and they maintain the information in their own repositories. Um, now it's more difficult to find the related information across these heterogeneous artifacts. Now let's raise the level of complexity, and let's talk about a software development team that is distributed across the globe. And let's say that parts of the system is developed by another organization, let's say they're contracting a, a subpart of the system. Now it becomes even more difficult to find the related information since the information is not only geographically distributed but is under different authority domains since we have subcontractors involved now in the picture. So the goal of my research is to be able to identify these related information which may be distributed, may be heterogeneous, and using explicit links to identify these connections. Thus far, my research has been applied to the field of software engineering, but the techniques that I've uncovered in software engineering can also be applied in other domains, such as e-science, or domains with large digital records, such as medical patient files or patent records. 
And software engineering specifically, software traceability, can help us quickly access the related information. So if we are interested in finding information on a particular module in the system, um, links to that system can answer questions like why this particular component is used, if it could be replaced, um, who are the people who wrote this particular uh, module, is this component tested, and does it meet requirements. In addition, traceability aids in understanding the entire system in understanding the impact of changes to the system, in debugging the system, and in communication between various stakeholders. In e-science, if we captured traceability links between the design and the various artifacts, as represented by the blue lines, then it will help us in understanding the rationale behind the experiment um, that is referred to as data provenance. It will also help us in tracking the past experiments that have been performed, the related data sets, and the resulting publications. So in the entire soft, uh, experiment life cycle. So now I move on to talk about some of the challenges in being able to capture these traceability links. And this uh, section is in the context of my industry work at Wonderware. This work is in collaboration with Frederick Francois and uh, Richard and Taylor. So a quick background uh, on the context of this work. I did this work uh, at Wonderware, which is based in Lake Forest, California. And the company is a leading supplier of industrial automation software. Um, they have a distributed development uh, setting where they have developers in the US, Australia, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and India. At the time of the project, there were more than 40 projects going in parallel, and they had 250 development employees. The company was interested in two types of traceability, requirements traceability and process traceability. What's requirements traceability? Well, essentially, it's mapping the different artifacts produced to the requirements to ensure that those artifacts satisfy the customer requirements. Process traceability, meanwhile, is mapping the actual processes, the day-to-day -day tasks, to company procedures to make sure that these processes conform to the company procedures. Um, the Wonderware was interested in both types of traceability to comply with government regulations. They have customers, uh, food and pharmaceutical companies, who have to abide by government regulations. Thus, the software that runs in their plants have to abide by these regulations as well. Um, in addition, some of their big customers require audits on their development process, and thus uh, process traceability was needed. Finally, they also needed to uh, manage their projects more efficiently. The company needed an end-to-end -end traceability, but as I will discuss, traceability is a hard problem. Why? It requires a lot of manual intervention. And there are many tr uh, research approaches, but these are rarely adopted in practice, simply because they're not feasible. Here's an overall picture of the challenges at Wonderware. Um, there's a high cost to the commercial tool that they were using at the time. It, it was an off-the-shelf tool. And um, even though it was expensive, it still wasn't meeting the needs of the company. Um, the development team had to enter data redundantly into different tools. Uh, this resulted in document obsolescence because you update one file, but the other files are not updated, so you have documents getting obsolete. At the same time, documents are inconsistent, um, all because they were using heterogeneous tools. Um, the team was also using some ad hoc workarounds just to try to get the files together. Uh, as I said, they have distributed development, so artifacts are distributed. Um, that makes it difficult to access the artifacts if you are outside the groups. You have remote users, which makes it more difficult. Uh, coordination is difficult, and so project managers had to manually track their projects. Analyzing these problems, I saw that these uh, re mirror um, economic, technical, and social perspectives. And thus, to address the traceability challenges, we have to address all these perspectives at once. All right, so we developed an in-house traceability tool. 
and we used these key design decisions. At the top is minimizing cost. That was a key concern of the company. We minimized cost by using, by developing this traceability tool on top of existing tools that the company already used. So we didn't have to go out and buy new software. We also designed the software to be intuitive so it minimized training time. We bounded the problem space. What that is, is we just identified what are the key artifacts, key information that we need to trace across the organization. Um, we supported existing work practices. We didn't want to drastically change what the people were doing um, because we want all of them to buy into our tool. We want them to use our tool in order for us to achieve end-to-end -end traceability. We entered into information once um, by centralizing information into repositories. So the project management group have their own repository, the architect group have, has their own repository, the QA group has their own repository, and all their information is being fed into this repository. That information is then displayed into the different tools that they're using. So Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, and whatnot. And finally, we identified the limits of automation. Um, we identified which are the priority items to be automated and um, found that there are some mappings between artifacts that's difficult to automate simply because there's no textual similarity. It has to be user um, identified. So the results of this uh, study or work um, show that the time spent in performing the traceability tasks were cut in half. Um, they needed less people to maintain this tool. It was easier to uh, maintain. It, they had a low cost of deployment. And at the time this was reported, it was running successfully for over a year. Um, it was successful such that all the active projects of the company have, were migrated into this in-house trace tool. Um, the architect group liked the tool. Uh, it was easy to use, minimal training required and it also helps them in their high-level design tasks. Um, just really quickly, we just wanted to show you the model that we followed. These are the artifacts that we've selected to trace. Um, marketing requirements, use cases, functional recs, and test cases. These map to specific software development lifecycle phases, uh, indicated by the dotted lines. We provided workflow support. We identified who the key users are, these are the producers of trace information, and these without the boxes are the consumers of trace information. Uh, it was important for us to um, mainly cater to the needs of the producers of trace information because they are doing most of the work of entering the information. Here's our tool design. We have a back-end database, workflows um, supported by SharePoint, we use word macros to do a bi-directional consistency between the repository and the documents. So it's all automated. Um, they in enter information into the word document, then the macros would update the database. Um, if other people enter information on that word document again, that's updated in the database. So the next time uh, an, a user opens the word document, they can see the latest and greatest. There's no inconsistency. And we use various UI um, to access the, the workflow support. Here's a screenshot of the SharePoint and how we provided workflow support. Here's a high level task, manage use case list. That is subdivided into subtasks that are independent of each other. These link to specific windows that help users perform that particular task. So what does this do? Well, it raises the visibility of the lifecycle tasks so that there's more coordination within the team. And um, it helps also with working with the remote groups because they can see where the do documents are. There's a central portal for them to go to. All right, we also created automatically generated reports with InfoPath. For this particular window, it shows you information being pulled from different repositories. So this information is being pulled from the project management repository this information is being pulled from the architect uh, repository, and this test results is being pulled from the test group. So uh, in one window, you can see information that is owned by different groups, and they like this very much because now they can trace. <laughs> they can see the artifacts across the different groups, 
and um, the different groups can access the same information. All right, so that result um, was uh, good. It worked well for that one setting, but I wanted to find a more generalizable answer to software traceability challenges. And that's why I looked at the domain of eScience to look, get possible insights. As I studied the domain of eScience and data provenance in particular, I found some parallels between the two fields. Um, so these, this chart just tells the parallels between the two fields. So traces in software traceability is analogous to provenance, lineage, data pedigree in um, eScience. Um, as far as item being traced, um, there's a lot of heterogeneous files in both fields. So with the metadata for data provenance, you might want to trace email, research papers. Um, in software engineering, you might want to trace requirements documents, wiki pages, code. Um, so all heterogeneous files. And in both domains, there's a context on which the tracing occurs. Um, it could be during an experiment run or a software project. And then there's the bigger context, which is the organization. And then there's the domain on which that particular provenance is being applied to. Maybe it's physics, maybe it's biology. Whereas in software traceability, there's a domain of application. Is it the medical field? Is it the government-related um, software? Also, there are similar challenges for both fields. There's the concern of overhead. So when you're capturing provenance, you start thinking about what is the cost of storage overhead for that captured metadata. Um, in addition, you start thinking also about what is the training time for these researchers to learn this provenance tool. In software traceability, I mentioned the overhead of capturing these links and maintaining the traceability links and learning the traceability tool. Um, another challenge is the lack of interoperability between the tools that are being used in both domains. So in eScience, there are different data provenance systems, but they don't talk to each other. So the provenance captured in one tool can't be exported over to the other tool. Uh, same thing in software engineering. Information entered in, in a one tool is hard to translate over to another tool. So they have to do manual you know, data entry. Incompatibilities uh, occur in both fields. So you have incompatible data types in eScience and different data types in, uh, in software also. Different perspectives. In eScience, you might have a big research group. Each one has their own perspective, um, different expertise. So they're coming into the project with different perspectives. Same thing in software traceability. A software development team has a, an analyst, you have a, a developer, QA engineer, all of them are looking at the data from different perspectives. So we have to cater to these different perspectives. Um, it was interesting for me when, when I was doing this study back in 2007, when I came across this life cycle of an in silico experiment, an experiment conducted using computers, I thought, hey, look at that. You have phases that are similar to the software life cycle. <laughs> You have a design phase, you have an experiment running phase, which is kind of like implementation or testing, and then you have the experiment publication, which is somewhat similar to the deployment of software. So I thought, well, that was interesting. <laughs> um, when I was doing this uh, study, again, back in 2007, these were the main systems that I encountered. Um, I categorized them into different levels. Um, we have systems at the operating system level that simply capture provenance by capturing operating system level events, such as file open, file close, file edit, and so on. Then at the highest level, we have workflows like Kepler, Taverna, and Vis Vistrails, and so on, that capture provenance based on the experiment design. So when you look at the provenance, it's easier to understand what's going on. Um, just some of the summaries of the insights that I've gleaned from data provenance. Um, the provenance of data is intertwined with the provenance of process. What does that mean? What that means is the history of data is intertwined with what actually happened during the experiment. What are the functions that were applied to this particular data set? 
The second bullet says that provenance collection is stakeholder centric. What that means is the researcher who is running the experiment has the ability to determine how often they will collect provenance, um, at what level of granularity, who they will publish it to, and so on. And that was a big idea for me to transfer over to software traceability because usually in software engineering, um, software traceability is not stakeholder centric. It's more management centric where the management says, you trace these artifacts. Um, the third level is automated provenance capture has its limits. What this means is that the framework on which provenance is being automatically captured determines the level of semantics of the provenance. So if you have a tool that captures operating system level events, then the level of semantics is just there at the operating system level of events. But if you have a framework that captures the experiment level, then you have an understanding of what actually happened during the experiment. Finally, uh, a technique called reasoners was used in automatically inferring relationships. So you might have data sets that are indirectly related and these re reasoners can tell you, okay, how there's a new relationship that, that takes place between these um, data sets. So all these insights were used to uh, inform my software traceability technique, which I will now talk about. All right. Um, and this was my PhD thesis. Okay, so ACTS. What does ACTS stand for? It's Architecture-Centric Traceability for Stakeholders. Um, what this means is it focuses the links on the architecture, so capture the links to the architecture. Um, it's for stakeholders, so we allow users to choose what kinds of information they're interested to link to. Finally, we provide mechanisms for capturing, filtering, visualizing, and analyzing the links. If we go back, if we remember the traceability challenges we encountered at Wonderware, economic, technical, and social, ACTS is a technical approach that considers the economic and the social perspectives. And that will become more clear as I, I go on. All right. Um, here's a model of my um, approach. At the center is the architecture. The cones represent different perspectives. So we have the architect perspective, developer perspective, field engineer, and QA perspective. Each perspective is only interested in capturing links um, to certain artifacts. So for example, an architect may only be interested in linking requirements to design. That's it. So that they're free to do that. And that's indicated by the dotted lines. Now, a developer may only be interested in capturing links between code and the design. That's fine. And, and what we can do once we captured all these links is we can aggregate them so you can have a project-based link that is complete and accessible to the different members of the development team. All right, now I'll move on to the mechanisms of our approach. Um, and I'll go through each of these mechanisms in the next slides. So the first one is we capture links prospectively. This idea was uh, borrowed from eScience because um, I watch how, or I read how provenance systems would record the actual experiment run based on the workflow. So I thought, hey, we can borrow that recording, put that over to software traceability, and help us link together heterogeneous information. Um, so the idea is we have users click on a record button and in the background links are automatically created. This allows us to capture contextual and temporal relationships that would have been otherwise lost if we didn't uh, capture these interactions. This allows us to read, uh, link to read access artifacts and also to link incrementally. So users don't have to do all the linking all at once. They can simply click the record button whenever they do their work. Linking would take place in the background, turn it off the next day, do the same thing, and then you can build up your base of links over time. So it's incrementally done. Here's a scenario that a person might um, follow. So let's say that an architect is visiting a particular component 
and then proceeds to open these other files like email, white paper, uh, mock-up. In the background, links would be created uh, when the recording is turned on. So you might wonder, well, if they're just following the user actions, how does it know which artifact to link to? Well, that's, that's where the rules come in. Uh, these are user customized. You might think of them as policies. Um, and these rules, the idea is borrowed from reasoners in e-science. These rules are the ones that filter or weed through the user interactions so it can check okay, the user is not interested in linking to PowerPoint files. We won't link to any of the PowerPoint files that they visited. Um, and these rules can also check on the patterns of events or time of access or primary trace artifact to create these links. In addition, these rules can add link semantics or information about why this particular link is important. The next thing is being able to cross the tool boundary. Now, the, crossing the tool boundary is an important thing because we encounter heterogeneous files. Um, for this, these insights were borrowed from the area of open hypermedia. Um, so two things. We have first class NRE links and adapters. Okay, so we treat links as first class objects. What that means is we can manipulate these links, we can store these links on their own. Thus, we can have endless destination instead of two destination that is often in, on the web. You have two destinations. Um, we can also then link to read-only artifacts, as I said. The second idea is having these adapters. Okay? These adapters are tool-specific. So you create an adapter for a particular tool. And the, we have two specialized adapters, a recording and a rendering adapter. Now, a recording adapter is the one that keeps track of the user actions. It creates a log of the actions on the data. The rendering adapter is the one that is in charge of displaying a specific data within that tool at that particular location. So let's say that you link to page 500 in Word doc X. The rendering adapter will open to page 500 on that Word doc X. So you don't have to go through the different pages finding the specific location that you want to link to. Um, here's a visual of how um, it might also work. So let's say that you have the architecture and um, you are interested in looking at the rationale for why this module was created the way it was. And uh, there's a link to a video recording of the meeting of the team. So if you have an adapter, a rendering adapter, and it knows a specific location within the video, you can have the adapter simply fast forward to that location and start playing at that specific location. Um, you can do other things with the other tools. So for example, if you are linking to a Word document, you can have the tool simply look for a particular search term and have it display at that first occurrence of that search term. All right, now move on to visualizing the link information using mashups. So um, mashups are popularly used today to aggregate information from different sources on the web. Um, so we get that idea and we aggregate the linked information to provide real-time status. Okay, um, here's an example of a mashup. Again, here's the architectural design for ArchStudio 4. And the different components are color-coded. The outlines are color-coded. So those that, are, that have a yellow outline like this, or those other ones, are the components with bugs. And the components that have not been implemented are outlined in red, like that one at the top. And there's this one here at the bottom. Now if you zoom in and, take a, and select that particular component that has a related bug, you can click on it. It will display the list of links, which is right there at the top right. And when you visit that link, it will bring you to the bug tracking database to show you the particular bug that it was associated with. All right. Well, that's AX. Now we're moving on to how we enhance AX with topic modeling. 
This is in collaboration with my brother, Arthur Asuncion, and uh, uh, my PhD advisor, Richard Taylor. Okay, so let me introduce you to the idea of topic modeling. Um, you have a text corpus, and you can feed that into a topic learning algorithm. Um, after it goes through the topic learning algorithm, out comes automatically discovered topics at the top and documents that are tagged by, by those topics. So if you look closely uh, at this particular example, each of the lines at the top there represent a topic. Um, and the words are the highest probability words that represent that particular topic. Now these are two New York Times articles that were uh, taken. Uh, I think this analysis was done on a period of a month of all the New York Times articles. And we can see on the first snippet, um, of the, has mostly red and maroon topics. Now if we look at our legend up there, we can see that the maroon and red topics represent the September 11th attacks. Okay? Um, if we look at the blue uh, topics, um, we see that it is related to the business topic. So um, this makes sense for the first article because if you read the article, it's talking about the effects of the September 11 attacks on business. So you have those two topics. Um, here on the lower uh, article snippet, we see mostly green and light green topics. Now, when we look at the, the, our topics discovered, we see that those are biz, uh, sports topics. And that makes sense when we read the article because it's talking about a specific football game. All right, so how does, oh, more, more details on the topic modeling. Um, we use a particular topic model called latent Dirichlet allocation. And uh, as I said, a topic is represented as a probability distribution over words, and a document is modeled as a probability distribution over topics. So we can have automa automated analysis on the documents we can find out exactly what the document means by simply running this topic modeling. So how does topic modeling help ACTS? Well, um, ACTS or prospective traceability, as you capture more and more links, you increase your artifact base and you have more var varied types of artifacts. When you have that, it increases your topic quality because topic modeling works on large, large data sets. Okay? Topic modeling helps ACTS, or prospective traceability, because it can automatically identify the topical content of the documents. So it can aid the prospective capture. Instead of floundering around the search results, you can actually intelligently navigate to the documents that you're interested in. It also aids in the uh, detection of false positives. So link quality goes up. So it's a win-win situation for both techniques. All right, so here's an overview of our approach. We've developed three tools. We have Trace, we have Axe, and we have the team. Um, I'll talk about each tool now. So Trace is the topically rich artifact search engine. It's somewhat similar to Google, only it's enhanced with topics. So you have a, a search term that you can search for, and the results are documents with a matching search term. In addition to that, you have the topics that have been automatically discovered based on that set of documents with that search term. And within each result, you have the topic distribution. So you know what the document um, contains. So essentially, this guides in the prospective capture of trace links. Um, so you have an understanding of what these documents uh, contain. You can also order by topic distributions. So if you were interested in topic two, um, then it will order the search results again by the, uh, the closely related uh, um, distribution to topic two. 
um, if we are interested in one particular artifact and we want to find artifacts that are similar to that particular document, we can simply click on similar pages and it will show you uh, documents that have the similar topic distribution. So we have clusters, we have documents that are clustered together based on similar topics, serving as a recommendation system. All right, so now we sh show you the screenshot for our AXE tool, or the tool that captures links prospectively. We can click on the start recording, select the archipelago, and perhaps visit one of these links. When we do that, we stop the recording, we get a confirmation of which links were visited, and then they are added to the list of links for that particular component. We now move on to the third tool, which is our visualization tool. Um, here's our visualization tool called Team, or Topic Enhanced Architecture Mashup. It shows you the architecture, and when you select a topic on the left side of the screen, it highlights the sections of the system that is related to that particular topic. So it gives you a bird's eye view of the entire system. Um, when we zoom in to one particular component and select it, we see the list of links with their topic distributions on the right side of the screen. And you can visit the links and uh, look at the artifacts. Um, based on the color coding of the topics, you can automatic, you know, easily identify which ones are false positive links. All right. So all that to set the background for um, how we can apply these techniques or um, acts like techniques to e-science. Um, again, data prov provenance simply means the origin and history of data. Um, the most predominant means of capturing data provenance has been scientific workflows. Um, so what are the challenges to data provenance? Um, well, Jim Gray said that managing information is now a necessity for scientists, whether it be data collection, analysis, publication, or retrieval. And this applies from small-scale uh, research projects to large-scale research projects. Um, the challenge is it's, it's expensive to capture all the metadata. It's too laborious for scientists to manually write down what's the setting on the instrument, what is the parameter on this function, uh, what version of this tool are we using. Um, and it's also different, difficult to collect provenance across different tools. And data analysis takes place across heterogeneous tools. So what is the state of the art in metadata capture? Well, we can have researchers manually annotate their experiment design. You can do that with Kepler. We could do that with uh, Taverna in the MyGrid project. Another approach is to manually group the experiment-related objects together. So what that means is you simply upload to one folder uh, online all the publications, uh, email, whatnot, and that is supported by the My Experiment project. Another approach is to use the idea of ontologies um, to automatically link the documents uh, with provenance logs. Now these ontologies take time to build up because you have to identify important concepts, how they are related to each other. That's supported within the MyGrid project. Another suggestion by Gray and, uh, is to have the team use software tools. So all the communication is through the software tools and then you can just search through the electronic records. So you can, like the Met Office, which is UK's uh, National Weather Service, um, they've built this flexible configuration management tool, which is based on open source CM systems, open source bug databases. And with that, in that setting, you can simply search through electronic records. What is the state of the art in capturing um, uh, provenance across different tools? Well, more recently, they have this open data interchange um, provenance metadata. Uh, they called it open provenance model. And the idea here is 
the different provenance systems can export to this standardized metadata so that the other provenance systems can consume it. So that's a way to, to do data inter interchange. Um, another uh, means is to use a protocol that allows for sharing and accessing data across different tools. And that's using the open, um, open data protocol. Um, for some reason, my, my link got cut off. I guess it, it was a link online. <laughs> um, so this helps in sharing the same data by using a particular protocol. And you can share it to the, to the other members of the team. Um, still another approach is to chain multiple workflows. So if you have a big research team, each team is using a particular workflow, um, you can have the different workflows that were produced to be chained together. So you, ha you can have a workflow created in Taverna, workflow created in WS VLAM, and another workflow created in Kepler. And you can just link all those workflows together, and that will represent a big overarching experiment. A final approach is to use a centralized repository. So essentially, you can have the workflow specifications that are done in the different tools, translate them to Prolog. Prolog is your central repository, and that keeps track of your provenance. Um, what are the issues with these? Well, certainly these are steps in the right direction. Um, um, but the thing is, they still require scientists to adopt these specialized tools. And end-to-end -end provenance capture is not yet achieved. So you can do it in, within these um, some limited, limited tools. What is my goal? My research goal is to support scientists in the capture of data provenance within their existing work environment. And I call this NC2. So I'd like to use an approach that is a lightweight uh, means of capturing metadata, to capture metadata across different tools, and to capture these links to metadata as scientists perform their scientific analysis. So capture in the background. What's my research plan? For the short term, I'd like to build a piecemeal provenance support within popularly used tools by scientists. Um, and this is uh, supporting the NC2 capture. Why do I want to do this? Well, it'll minimize training time. So the scientists are already familiar with the tool. No training time involved, or very little training time. Um, we minimize tool setup and encourage wide adoption across the different researchers. I plan to build a provenance link base to uh, maintain and um, store the different links to the metadata. I plan to uh, aggregate and analyze all the captured provenance using machine learning techniques, like topic modeling, and then to visualize these captured links um, to serve as a metadata for the experiment. What's my long-term plan? Um, I'd like to move towards supporting large-scale science so investigating the scalability of acts-like techniques to support collaborating scientists. Um, investigating how I can use insights from the research area of software architecture to build a scalable tool support. And finally, investigating the scalability of topic modeling or other machine learning techniques and analyzing very, very large-scale metadata. As of today, though, topic modeling can scale to hundreds of thousands of artifacts um, quite well. So now I'll discuss my current and planned projects. The first one is the provenance within Excel. Uh, why Excel? Scientists in the natural sciences use Excel to analyze their data. Um, this is evidenced by the number of books. I just Googled how many books we're geared to scientists on how to use Excel, and there's a whole bunch of them. So yes, we're going to create an adapter for Excel, an Excel add-in. And here's a screenshot um, where I just had my students start working on this one. So on the right side is uh, the Excel add-in, and 
what you can do with this is you open a file, you select the record button, and we can uh, track the user actions on the um, interaction with the data. If we could switch to the uh, video, that'd be great. Okay. All right. So we'll quickly show you a video clip on um, the Excel add-in that we've uh, developed. Maybe stop it. Um, oh, there it is. Do you want to start it again? Or? Sure. So can you go back? So what we can see here is uh, we are going to select uh, um, data. This happens to be uh, data regarding the solar flux. And we're going to open this uh, file. Um, and then we'll see on the screen the file that's been opened. Um, and then we can record. Once it's recording, it's tracking the user actions on the data. So we can track whether the user has formatted the data, highlighted yellow, highlighted it red. And um, once we're done manipulating the data, we can click on the, the stop record button and visualize it. Uh, the idea is this will come up as like a workflow-like visualization, but at, at this point, it's, it's simply a text file. This will be rendered as a, a box and arrow later on. That The intent there is to, um, if we can switch to the PowerPoint. Go back to the slides, that would be great. The idea they did within Excel spreadsheet. Represent that as a workflow, not looking at macro code. Edit the visualization, save it, and that will translate into the macro changes so that later on they can rerun the same, uh, the modified workflow or even share it to others. And um, it's, a, it's within a small context, but I think this is very useful since a lot of, like I said, a lot of scientists use Excel and um, very useful for uh, analyzing data within Excel, tracking provenance within Excel. Now, another project that I've planned, this is still in the planning stages, is to capture provenance across different tools. So I'm planning to build adapters. Um, actually, for these tools, Word, PowerPoint, and Adobe Acrobat, I already have tool adapters. I just need to improve them to gear them towards eScience. Um, then I'd like to build a tool adapter for Outlook or Microsoft Exchange, whatnot, so that I can incorporate metadata that is found in email, in Word documents, um, in published papers, PDFs, and link them together. Another planned project is to store these provenance links um, in an SQL backend database. Then this SQL database will then interface with the visualization tool, um, which will be used to help the people outside the science team to access this metadata, public, students, educators, whoever. Um, so. Those are ones that are really close uh, uh, to, be, to being uh, worked on. All right, so I'll wrap up the, the talk with insights from Axe. Um, what are the lessons that I've learned based on the experience of uh, implementing tool support for Axe? Well, links to metadata can be captured within the scientist's work environment, I think. And we do that by building these tool-specific adapters. Links to heterogeneous metadata can be automatically captured. Um, we can pro capture provenance across different tools and analyze them using machine learning techniques like topic modeling. 
And then we can do visualization so that we can support a comprehensive understanding of the scientific analysis. I'd like to acknowledge the undergraduate students who helped in the development. The first two were the ones uh, instrumental in doing the Excel add-in, my current students at UW Bothell. Um, these are the students at UC Irvine who helped me develop the AX tool. Um, I'm currently being funded at UW Bothell. And uh, NSF uh, was my source of funding for the development of the AX research. Any questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a long list. Of wow, <laughs> great. Inter That's interesting, good. Interesting That's ideas. good. We'll probably don't want to talk about offline. But, Definitely. Um, you know, one of the one of the questions that I had was just specific to a couple points you made earlier on, and then you kind of pulled it together mm -hmm. with the, the provenance link base. Mm -hmm. at the end is, mm -hmm. is how do you envision this being searchable at a at a lab level, at an institution level, uh, at a domain level? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I guess in all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely all of the above. Um, there may be, depending on the stakeholders involved, there may be some restrictions on, you know, what they want to publish or, you know, but certainly I can envision this being searchable at, at, the, at the organization level, uh, you know, even including the public if, if they want to use the search tool, certainly. So I'm thinking, I think about the My Experiment tool, and mm -hmm. I'm not familiar, I'm familiar with the tool, but not familiar with the search ability, mm -hmm. but the ability mm -hmm. to have those semantic connections mm -hmm. across uh, programs or across mm -hmm. workflows mm -hmm. uh, would, be, would be powerful. Oh, yeah. yeah. Currently, I think what they're using is uh, building this ontology. Mm -hmm. um, great, but like I said, it requires time yeah. to build up an ontology. Yeah. Um, with this one, we're trying to provide a lightweight support. So the users don't have to spend so much time trying to set things up. We do the setup for them and then they can start using it. Another super practical question about, for instance, the, the Excel item where you're mm -hmm. recording, stopping recording. Mm -hmm. um, how necessary is it, I think you alluded to this earlier in your talk, how easy is it to capture, start to finish, and then realize, oh, right in the middle of that, I went off on a little fork and I did, did something I didn't want to do, or, uh oh, I hopped over and went to Facebook, yeah, and, yeah, you know, or yeah. the phone rang. Sure, sure. How easy is it to go back and, and edit, um, edit a capture, or is it necessary to redo the capture? Um, um, uh, the way I envision this is it'll be easy to edit. First of all, any, any digression to other tools will not be recorded. It would only be in the Only within Excel. So that eliminates that. And that, in that particular tool, some of the, was it, Acts or um, trace it would go across tools. Yeah, Acts right? goes okay. across tools, but for the Excel add-in, it would just be within that tool. Perfect, makes sense. Yeah. Now, if they have a digression within Excel, um, my solution is simply record everything. So we will have a visualization of everything that they've done, and um, they can look at the visualization and say, oh, I don't mean this particular step. Mm -hmm. Right-click, delete, so that that would be eliminated from the captured provenance. They can save it, and when they save it, that would be automatically translated to the macro, uh, you know, the translated macro level, so that later on they can rerun the edited workflow. Um, more practical questions. Sure. Literally, you're, you, right now you're capturing it as a, as a text file. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that would get, uh, I'm trying to think of like, that would get wrapped up in the XLSX format mm -hmm. and would travel with the document. I'm trying to think about the reproducibility sure. or the findability after sure, the fact. Sure, sure. Um, certainly, yes, we can uh, capture this provenance that we captured into this .xlsx right. zip file. Okay. And um, later on, another user can open it up and see that this is the processing right. that's, that's been done on this document. And then the $64,000 question is, what's going to make a scientist want to do this? What's the motivation? I mean, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you've got economic, I understand, yes. the technical yes. possibilities yes. there, but it's the social mm -hmm. that, you know, it's fantastic. I love the fact that you have my experiment, people who are sharing the workflows, but mm -hmm. literally getting scientists to say, okay, I'm going to capture, you know, the, the long tail of science that I've done in this yeah. Excel spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. You know, what, and do you have any thoughts on what's going to motivate them to do that? Um, well, Certainly, sometimes they do some exploratory work on their analysis. A day later, they forget, what did I do? So essentially, what 
what happens right now is they have to redo the whole thing. Well, with this one, it can save them time because it recorded what they did. And they can just look at the visualization and say, oh, yeah, that's what I did. Oh, no, this doesn't work. So I can, I can modify it and save it and perhaps pass it on to somebody else or just keep it to myself if that's the intent of the scientist. This, and this is all under their control. So um, I think that's another way that they can buy into this tool. It's, it's all within their control. It's up to them if they want to share it. Um, and uh, it's up to them, you know, how to use the tool. So I think being able to cut down on them having to redo their analysis, because that's what I've heard so far is time they forgot. Productivity. Yes, exactly. They, they spend a lot of time just managing the data and not really on the real science of thinking about what's the ramification of this finding, you know? What, what does, what's the implication? I might be thinking whether you can save this as kind of like a middle method so that this are the set of transformation I performed of this set of data and then I'm going to save the, the process and then I can just export this process to you and you can apply this on your data. Yeah. The, re the reproducibility right, concept. Right, right. Yes. So, yeah. so that, that that will become kind of like a, a, a lab procedure that you will perform mm -hmm. and then it's, it's a really good means of sharing our, our methods. Perhaps, I don't know, maybe down the road uh, with editors, they could require a certain type of reproducibility, and this could be one of the things that scientists can submit. This is how I've done my analysis on this data set. Um, long term, I didn't mention this, but I was hoping I could do this with Excel and then with other scientific tools too. Then later on, aggregate all that information and then run the, the topic modeling on all that captured provenance. And I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Hazel. You're you've, welcome. Uh, you've given me a lot to think about. Hopefully the people that watch this at some later point will we'll, uh, we'll, uh, have a lot of ideas, too. I can, I, I've got a list of 10 people I think you should be talking to. So, all right, so, cool, so that's really great. <laughs> inside Microsoft and, and, uh, and further, for much further afield as well. So. Oh, good to hear that. Thank yeah. you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.